Good morning. My name is Jed and I'm one of the evangelists here at Central. If you're visiting with us for the first time or you've been with us a couple times and doesn't matter if you're passing through or you've just moved to the area, we want you to know that you're our honored guest this morning. We're so happy to have you here with us. We look forward to an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better and and shake your hand and and, uh, draw some encouragement from you and we hope that that we can give you some love and some encouragement back. We're we're happy that you're here this morning. Now, I I, I debated on whether or not to record this thing outside today because uh, as you can see, it's raining and it's wet and and there's people that are driving to work and and we're due, we're scalded for more rain. But I, I got to thinking how much of what it looks like behind me right now through the wind and the rain and and it's storming and there's more to come and and there's chaos by way of cars and honking how much of that mirrors our lives and through the course of my life and your life we we go through stuff and there's storms and it's raining and it's chaotic and it's hectic and yet you insert this word that we've introduced you to and have been talking about this greek word koinonia which means together and community. And this idea that I got your back and you got mine, that no matter what we're going through, we're all in this together. That's our focus for 2023, as we concentrate and look into falling in love with Jesus by falling in love with Jesus' people and the work of this Greek word koinonia. Now, really, in order to do that, in order to build that togetherness, we've got two things lined up for you. The first of those is your small groups, which you can still sign up for out in the foyer and begin on January the 15th. The second of those is something that's new for us. And this homeworks or these homeworks, these packets that we handed out two weeks ago and uh, are still available in the foyer. And within these within these packets are are these lessons where we want you to work on building koinonia at home the importance of of gathering together as a family and building that koinonia and and looking at god's word and and studying together the power in togetherness at home is just as powerful as togetherness and connectivity at a church family that's what we're looking forward to And we hope that if you have any questions on on the homeworks or the small groups uh, that you'll ask. I'll be out in the foyer by the welcome station after services if you have any questions about the homeworks or the small groups. Your first homework is on January the 1st, New Year's Day. So buckle up and get ready for all of these new and exciting things that we're doing as we look forward to 2023 and falling in love with Jesus by falling more in love with Jesus people. Now, as we step into our time of worship, I hope that your mind is right and you're ready to give it all to the one who gave it all to us. Let us now begin our worship.
Saints, lift your voices. forward directed in prayer worship the king What a great day to worship. And as Jed said, let's give it all for him that gave it all. 
Would you bow with me, please? Dear God in heaven, we come to you this morning in prayer. We honor and praise your name, Father. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done for us and the way you've blessed us in this life so far. We're so thankful that you gave your son to die on that cross so that we might, might be redeemed. We recognize you, Father, and love you. We know that you are truly the creator of all things, the Lord of Lord, the Prince of Princes, the King of Kings, and the Great I Am. And as we are here this morning, Father, may each of us forget what's going on in the world this morning so that we can direct our minds in worship and hear this sermon that will be brought to us. We will honor you at the table this morning to remember our Lord and Savior that died on that cross as we take Holy Communion. And Father, we thank you for this family of like believers. We thank you for the elders of this church. We're so thankful for the children. We pray that you will bless these children and they will grow up in this church and continue the growth as you would have it. Father, we pray for our young men and women in the military. Several of us have sons, grandsons, and daughters and granddaughters that are serving in the military. Be with them, Father. Help them to endure the hardships they go through for our benefit. We pray, Father, for the elders of this church. We pray that you will guide them so that they will lead this congregation and this church to all the things that these men aspire to. We pray for the sick of this congregation, Father. There are several members that have had procedures and that are going through procedures. And those that have lost loved ones, we, we pray for Becky Cram and her family. It's so good, Father, to see that Steve Carson and that other Steve that I think of that had such a hard time. They're back here with us today, and we're so thankful for that. Now, Father, as we prepare to hear this sermon again, let our hearts and minds be where they need to be this morning. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I want to begin with what uh, the Lord's Supper, making sure everyone has the items. Anybody does not, please raise your hand that you will be needing. As we prepare to take of the Lord's Supper this morning, I hope that each of us can focus a minute and think about what we're preparing to do, and that, of course, is to remember the Lord's sacrifice on the cross. We can read many scriptures where we are told to examine ourselves and make sure that we are in the right mind to do so, proclaiming in our own mind and our own heart the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a focus scripture that I'd like to share with you. It's found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27 and 28. And it reads as follows. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. I hope that each of us think seriously about what we're getting ready to do. The bread representing his body that was broken for you and I. And I, I think each of us have heard enough stories about the excruciating pain that is involved in crucifixion. I think we've had multiple times that we have had studies or someone has shared with us the fact that he went through that for you and I. Christ died for me. Christ gave his body for me that I might have life now and life eternally. And I think just like the early disciples did, we have the opportunity to partake of the same items, the bread, which represents that body and just as he instructed his disciples to do, he tells us to eat this bread in remembrance of him. So will you bow with me as we partake of the bread? Holy Father, bowing this morning around this table that was instituted by your son Jesus. And on that day, he gave his life. He wanted us to be reminded of the great sacrifice he gave his body. And I want to pray this morning, Father, as we partake of the bread, that each of us will do so with the focus on that sacrifice and pray we'll do it remembering what he did for each and every one of us. All this we pray in Christ's name. Amen. And we're instructed in the same way to take this cup, which represents Christ's blood, which was poured out. And I pray that each of us will think about that supreme sacrifice for all our sins. Past, present, and future. The blood of Christ took care of each and every one of those. I thank you so much, Father, for sending your son to produce victory over death. You took the death that I deserve, you and I deserve, and uh, took it away by sending your son to shed his blood. Will you bow now as we give thanks for the cup?
Father, we again bow before you. We're honored that you would think our life would mean so much. That you'd send your son the perfect sacrifice and that his blood would free us from the sin in our life. Give us the opportunity of eternal life. And we pray, Father, we'll do it just like instructed in your holy word that we will partake of this cup in remembrance of him and look forward to his coming again. In Christ's name, we pray. The Our responsibility is primarily to give in giving, is primarily just a uh, response to God's generosity. And I hope you and I look at it that way as Christians. We're responding to the great gifts God has given to us, and it's an expression of the joy and the gratitude that we all each ought to feel about 
just the bounty of everything God's done. I think about the opportunity we each have to share in the work that goes on in this place and outside of here that we have an obligation and responsibility to be part of. And so with that in mind, I want to share with you just a passage of Scripture as we think about giving. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whosoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have, what you've decided to give in your heart. Don't do it in a reluctant manner, not out of compulsion, because God loves a cheerful giver. So we have an opportunity to be able to take part in the work that goes forth from this place. And I want to remind those of us in giving that we have boxes in the back where you can put your contribution. And also guests, we're not soliciting as you join in worship with us anything other than that you would fill out that guest card and put it there as you leave today. Will you bow with me? Father, we thank you for the opportunity to bow again and give you thanks for the generosity of you have expressed in all our lives. We have health, the opportunity to be here to worship the true and the living God. And we thank you so much for all that we've been blessed with. And Father, out of, out of a cheerful heart, we pray that we will return to you those blessings that you have showered us with all the days of our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to again share those and be a part of God's family in spreading the borders of your kingdom. Thank you again, Father, for all you do and continue to bless us is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. If it's convenient for you this morning, let's all stand and sing. <clears throat>
<clears throat> well, good morning. I was riding on an elevator earlier this week, and uh, some of my fellow travelers, uh, one of them got on and asked somebody that they didn't know at all, said, well, you have all your shopping done? And they look, said, what? And he said, do you have all your shopping done? Oh, um, I think it took her a time to reframe where she was to where he was questioning her. And, and she said, oh, no, I have, uh, uh, so how about you? You have all your shopping done? Let me, uh, let me tell you about the worst gift I ever received. This was about 30 years ago. We were living in Lakeland, and uh, one of our neighbors, a few doors down, uh, she came, knocked on the door, and, and uh, she handed me a Bible. Now, that's not the worst gift or part of the gift. Uh, but it was what she said. Uh, she stood there for a moment and she said, uh, I was given this, it was a used Bible, I was given this shortly after I got married, and uh, she was probably in her mid-70s at this time, um, had been married a number of years, and she said, uh, and I was going through some things in my, in my closet and I found this, and I just, I don't have any use for it, and I thought maybe you could do something with it. And she handed it to me. And, um, and so I tried to engage her in some discussion about how important the Bible was and what she could find in the Bible. And she, she, she wasn't interested. She just, just wanted me to have it, said, maybe you can do something with it. Um, she said, but I just couldn't bear to throw it away. Um, isn't that sad? <laughs> um, that was the worst gift I ever got. And I've received many gifts through the years. My parents, uh, Melissa, my children, my grandchildren, uh, even a few from my siblings. And there have been occasions where I've gotten a gift and thought, what am I supposed to do with this? You, you've gotten one of those, or several. Um, but never has it affected me the way that this lady just saying, I don't have any use for this and thought maybe you could do something with it, hands me a Bible and essentially turns and walks away. Um, so I want to share with you this morning, because it's just a week away, by the way. I want to share with you five great gift ideas. And before I go any further, I want you to understand very clearly uh, that although I know it would be a great gift, I'm not talking like FSU apparel, um, FSU decor, uh, seminal items of any kind, although we know those would be great gift ideas. Some of you didn't appreciate that at all. <laughs> there was a game yesterday, but somebody didn't show up for that. I don't know if that's what that was all about. Uh, in James chapter 1 and at verse 17, James chapter 1 and verse 17, the Bible says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all things, and he is, he is the created all the lights of the heavens. And so James chapter 1 and verse 17 tells us that God is the giver of all good gifts. Wayne stood up here just a few moments ago and, and talked to you about the generosity of God and, and how much he's given to us and how our giving is a response to that or should be a response to that. And, and he's absolutely right on that, that uh, God has lavished us with so many good and wonderful things that the idea that we would be commanded to give, it should be an understanding that we would do that, that we would want to do that. 
And so James chapter 1 and verse 17 sets the stage. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down from God our Father. All good gifts come from God. And then Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25 shows us the reciprocal of that. It says, give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper, and those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. So just like God gives, we should give as well. So let me suggest to you this morning five great gift ideas that no one's going to take back, no one's going to exchange, and they are sure to fit. The first one is give the gift of encouragement. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you know, there's a principle here that, that shows us that all of us, all of us get down from time to time. All of us face challenges and struggles and we get down, and most of us, even become concerned about our own faith and our own salvation. It seems that to me that uh, people who've been Christians for a long period of time, they, they know they've been living right, they've been doing the best they can, they've been trying to, and yet still they face these challenges of feeling like maybe they're insufficient, maybe they, maybe they just can't do it, maybe God's not going to save them. And so they have these concerns about their own salvation. So listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Beginning at verse 8, it says, But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of faith and love, and and wearing as our helmet the confidence of our salvation. Now, to those of you who are Bible students, you recognize that sounds very familiar to what Paul said in the book of Ephesians about putting on the armor of God. Verse 9 says, For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out His anger on us. Christ died for us, so that whether we are dead or alive when He returns, we can live with Him forever. So so what Paul says is, I want you to be encouraged. I want you to, to know that when God did what he did. He did it not out of wrath, not out of anger. He did this to save you. And you want to have that kind of encouragement. So look at verse 11. He says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you also are already doing. You see, one of the, one of the responsibilities that we have is to, to share encouragement with others because maybe maybe I'm not down right now but maybe they are maybe the person next to you and the row two rows back and behind you uh, and they're they're feeling the the pressure and the weight and the challenges of life and time and and any number of things and so what he says is encourage them and encourage one another and realize that our faith is something that God has given to he didn't set it up so that we would perish He did all of this so that we would be saved. But sometimes we just kind of forget about that. And what he's saying is, encourage and remind one another of that. In Hebrew... Okay. I thought it is sound... The the sound has been off all morning. Some kind of echoey or something. So maybe I'll just whisper now. Because that was pretty loud. (laughs) I'm going to try to talk regular, okay? Andrew's sitting back. He's trying to, okay. In Hebrews chapter 10, a passage that we have abused and misused and beat people over the head with for years. Look at verse 23. I want you to see this in its context. It's better understood. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promises. See, now that affirms what we just read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. God can be trusted to keep his promises. Let us think of ways, verse 24, to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Verse 25, and let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So Hebrews chapter 10 says we meet together not not to just sit in a pew and not to be entertained, 
But we come together, number one, to worship God, and number two, to give encouragement to one another while we're here. Now, I realize this passage has been used to say, well, we have to attend every single service of the church. I don't believe that's what this is teaching at all. I think you should, don't get me wrong, because that's an important, wonderful thing for you to do to benefit you and others. But this verse is saying, look at it in the positive light that we hold tightly to this promise and then we want to encourage one another to do that. So you want to give a good gift to somebody? Be a Barnabas. Encourage them. Give encouragement to somebody. Somebody that's down or somebody that's facing challenges or difficulties. Or maybe you're not even sure that they are but it's just a word of encouragement, a word of strengthening and support for somebody. It's a great gift that you can give to somebody. The second thing I would suggest to you is to give the gift of patience. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, many recognize as this great chapter of love and the descriptive nature that the apostle gives by the Spirit of God to tell us what love is about. But notice what he starts out with, the very first quality of love. Love is patient, he said. Love is patient and kind, and on he goes. So let me ask, do you ever have any trouble with patience? Some of you said yes. More of you said yes. All of you should say yes. We, we all do from time to time. Uh, it just becomes a struggle or a challenge for us. Now, we want people to be patient with us. And, and fine, we almost expect people to be, what do they think I'm doing? Well, what, you know, the light turns green and, and within a millisecond, somebody's honking in back of you to get going. And you think, well, I'm not just sitting here for the fun of it, okay? It takes a, a second to lift my foot off the brake, put it on the gap, whatever. And, and we, we tend to think in those ways if we're on the receiving end. But how patient are we when you're already running late and you've got to be at the airport and the person in front of you looks like they're painting their nails and the light turns green and they're just finishing up that last... It becomes challenging. It becomes difficult for us not to sit there and blare on the horn ourselves or show our own impatience. First Corinthians 13, the very first quality, love is patient. You know, my Uncle Jim was one of the most patient men that I ever knew. I can remember when I was uh, 15 or 16 years old living in Tampa, and uh, they came down to visit from Ohio, and, and I, I can remember getting in his El Camino and Uncle Jim was driving, and I was just getting ready, you know, learning how to drive, 15, 16, I don't remember exactly if I had my license or not, and we were driving down Del Mabry in Tampa, very crowded, very busy, and my uncle let everybody and their brother in front of him as we were sitting there, and I thought, what? And then he stopped and allowed these feeder streets to come in off of Del Mabry, and they just kept coming in in front of us. And I remember thinking, you know, I was all the sage wisdom of a 15 or 16-year-old. And I thought, what in the world is Uncle Jim doing just sitting here? Doesn't he know he can just push on the gas and we could be in front of all those people? That, that was my thought process. But he, that was his character of life, not just in that one moment of driving but he was such a calm and patient individual. Maybe it's because he never had any children, um, <laughs> which he did not. But Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9 says, So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You see, we need to be patient. If, if you want to give a great gift to somebody, then be patient with them. Uh, everyone I know appreciates patience, and it is a one-size-fits-all. Thirdly, let me suggest to you to give forgiveness. I don't know where you are in your relationships with other people, but 
If you're unwilling to forgive, it doesn't just affect them, it affects you. And listen to what the apostle says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Now, here it is, verse 32. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. So, so what we see from this passage, and this is really critical to get, is that forgiveness is not based upon merit. That I don't just forgive people because they've earned it or deserve it. He says, forgive as Christ has forgiven me. You see, I I didn't earn that. I don't deserve that. And that's the standard. If I want to measure it by a standard of man, oh yeah, I can sit back and cross my arms and say, well, until he does this or she does that, I don't need to forgive them. But the standard that I'm measuring myself by is not other men but God. Listen to Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. Since God chose you to be his holy people that he loves, you must clothe yourselves, and listen how similar this sounds, tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, which we just talked about. And then he says at verse 13, make allowance for each other's faults, and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So again, the standard is not men, it's not merit. God has forgiven you, then you need to forgive others. One of the greatest gifts that you can give to somebody is the gift of forgiveness. Families have been torn apart and estranged for years, even for generations, because one person wouldn't forgive somebody else. Churches have been split and divided and people lost because one person chose not to forgive somebody else. Marriages have been shattered because someone refused to forgive. And so give the gift of forgiveness. Release them and release yourself by extending forgiveness. But this question always comes up. Or the statement, I've heard, I've heard it said many times through the years, said, well, you can't forgive somebody who doesn't ask for forgiveness. That's ludicrous. Yes, you can. And in fact, yes, you should. The, the idea that a person has to ask for my forgiveness, for me to grant them forgiveness is absolutely wrong. The reason I know that is not just something that's come to me in some way, but Jesus was hanging on the cross. He looked down at his tormentors, the very ones who had nailed him onto a cross. You remember what he said? Father, what? Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They weren't standing at the foot of the cross begging for Jesus to forgive them. They were standing there railing upon him, shouting insults at him, spitting upon him, and laughing and mocking him. And Jesus looks down and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so you can forgive people, even inhumane tormentors. I'm not saying it's easy. But I'm saying that you can, and in fact, I'm suggesting that you should. A third, excuse me, a fourth gift that you can give is the gift of listening. Say what? Listening? Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 13. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. Have you ever done that before? You ever ever got talking before you processed or learned and knew? Oh, okay, really, I should have just not said anything. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful 
and foolish. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 7 says, there's a time to tear and a time to mend. There's a time to be quiet and there's a time to speak. James chapter 1 and verse 19 says, be quick to hear. That is, make an effort. Haste. I, I, I want to hear rather than as you're talking, I'm doing what? I'm, I'm thinking of what my response is going to be to you. And that's, that's such a difficult thing to do. To listen, to listen through, and then to respond. Rather than, oh, he said this. She said that. And so now I craft my own response before I finish listening. A failure to listen is one of the major problems in, in marriages. It's one of the major problems in businesses. It's one of the major problems in relationships of all kind. In a marriage, if I don't feel like, if a, if a spouse does not feel like they're being listened to, now listen carefully, if you don't feel like you're being listened to in a marriage relationship, then what begins to happen is there begins to become a, a, a distance in the relationship. And if that distance is allowed to stay there and allowed to continue, it leads to finally feelings of indifference, of, well, uh, he's not going to listen anyway, she won't listen anyway, I and, and they're, they're pulling apart further and further, and now I become indifferent to that. And then when that occurs, intimacy erodes, and most people will look somewhere else to find it, somebody who they can connect with, someone who will listen to them. And although you may think you have the worst husband or wife in the world, there's somebody out there who says, nah, they're not that bad. I'd take him over what I got. I'd take her over who I have or over my nothing at all. And there's always that potential. Give the gift of listening to your spouse, to your children, to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to your friends, to your casual acquaintances, and to your brethren. And watch relationships blossom and build and grow. And finally, a fifth thing, and that is to, to give the gift of involvement or assistance to others. Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 1, the Bible says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you should not have anything to do with them. No, that's not what that verse says. <laughs> Look at it and see. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back to the right path. And be careful not to fall into the some, same temptation yourself. Verse 2, share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. And then he wraps it up by saying this. Listen to verse 3. And if you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. <laughs> you see, here, here's somebody gets involved in some sin, and I just think, I look, and I write them off, and I'm not, he says, no, you who are godly, you go out and try to restore that person. You know, one of the greatest responsibilities of a shepherd, of an elder in the church, is not to check on the sick or decide what color to paint the church building or, or how much to pay the preacher. The most important thing that a shepherd or an elder could ever do in the church is to rescue the perishing. And here is somebody who is involved in sin, and he says, you who are godly, you go out and seek to restore that person. Help that person back onto the right path. Share each other's burdens. Get in, involved in their lives. James chapter 1 and verse 27 says, Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. I want to tell you that sometimes... To get involved in people's lives 
It is so inconvenient. <laughs> you get a call in the middle of the night. You get a call right when you're getting ready to sit down and enjoy a meal with the family or to do something. And you get a call and you're up now and you have to take care of this. And, and, and then now I might even have to get in the car and I might have to go get my hands dirty and I might have to get involved in this, and I might have to help this person, and it might take 30 minutes, it might take three hours, it might take the next six weeks of helping them. But what he says is, that's what I'm supposed to do. That's what Christians do. Look out for those who are less fortunate. Give to them. Help those who are overcome in some kind of a, a sin if it, if it is that way. Take time out of your schedule. Get your hands dirty. Get involved. Be in people's lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He comforts us in all of our troubles and it doesn't say, so we will be comforted. It says, so that we will comfort others. See, God comforts us not to just make me feel good, not to just relieve a weight off of my shoulders. Although that happens, He comforts me so that now I can try to reach out and comfort other people. And so I need to get involved in their lives. One of the greatest ways you can do that in a congregation this size is to be a part of our small groups. And there's the signups that are still out there in the foyer. A couple of them are already full. Two of them are very close to being full. If you haven't signed up yet, I really encourage you to do that. Um, if we need to create more, we'll create more. We'd like to get everyone involved in these because now you sit around with eight or 10, 15 people in a home, and you don't just have a Bible study, but you share life together, uh, and, and how I might be able to help you, and how you might be able to help me. And that's one of the greatest blessings of our small groups when they function correctly. But this is a two-way street involvement is. You know, sometimes we think of ourselves as being virtuous, because I can handle it myself. I, I can take care of this. I don't need any help. I don't need anything. I, in fact, I don't even want to let people know what's going on. So I, and we think sometimes that's almost virtuous of us to do that. I want to suggest to you that sometimes it might be nothing more than pride and selfishness. That I don't want anybody to know I could use some help. I don't want anybody to know that I don't have this all wrapped up in a nice little bundle, that I'm struggling or I'm challenged and I'm dealing with some difficult things and I'm keeping other people out and not allowing them to do their service and helping me. Now, these are only five great gift ideas. The Bible is filled with a lot more. So I would encourage you to open your Bible and read your Bible and just look for the things that God says you can do to help other people along life's journey. Thanks for listening so carefully today and being a part of our worship this morning. If you're not a Christian, we'd sure love to help you become one. Again, as Wayne suggested of God's lavish gifts, the most lavish gift that God has ever given was His Son. Perfect, without sin, and He came to this earth knowing He was going to die. Well, you say, well, don't we all? But He knew He was going to be killed not because of anything he had done wrong, but because of my sins and your sins. So if you're not a Christian, God's lavish gift is to give his son to say he took your place. And all you have to do is give yourself to him. 
to be buried, to die, to your old life, to a life of sin, and be buried in a water, a water grave of baptism. The Bible says you raise up a brand new creature. All of your sins are washed away. If we could help you to do that, let us know while we stand and we sing this. <coughs> for gifts we can give, but just a way, some great characteristics to add to all our lives. I want to thank you each for being here today. Guests, we're very pleased that you stopped by to be with us. We pray that you'll come back and be with us again soon. I hope each of you will pick up the news and notes we have. There's a couple of additions that need to be added. And uh, first of all, let me just say, it's great to see Steve Schaefer back with us. We mentioned Steve Carson. Uh, Steve has written a very nice card. It'll be posted over here on the side. He wants to thank everybody for your prayers, phone calls, visits, and cards. They, of course, meant a lot to him. Uh, Christian love, Steve Schaefer. Also, in addition to the ones that you can look at and read online and other places, uh, sorry to announce that uh, Carlene Forbes' mother has passed away, passed away last, yesterday. And so let's remember Carlene and her family uh, in our prayers and thoughts. Also, Mike Barrow will be having some extensive surgery tomorrow at Shands in Gainesville. Uh, tomorrow, not sure about the time, but certainly when you are praying about all the other things that you pray about in your life, please add Mike to our list and others that are recovering. But thank you very much for being here, and we'll have a closing song in prayer.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you for the time we had to come here and assemble to sing songs to your to you and pray to you. We've heard a great lesson today, a good Bible study this morning. We ask you to go with us as we adjourn today. We ask you to be with the ones that are having surgeries coming up and need our prayers. We ask you to walk with us, guide us, and protect us. We ask you this in your son Jesus' name. Amen.